So we're, uh, we spent my how many, how many Bible classes on the beginning of First Peter? Quite a few, but uh, I thought there was some interesting stuff there. So we are going to hopefully go a little bit faster, but not so fast as all a blur. But we want to, you know, really concentrate on what, what's good. So uh, just a reminder uh, with these uh, nice little graphics from uh, uh, Bible Project on YouTube. Uh, Peter wrote it uh, around 60 or 80, 60, so about 30 years after Christ uh, was crucified and rose from the grave. Um, the gospel, St. Paul had spread the gospel throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, by Paul first went to the Jewish synagogues uh, to convince them that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. Some Jews believed, but a lot didn't, and they ended up persecuting uh, the Christians. And then what happened is that those Jewish people actually took the gospel to their Gentile friends and relatives and neighbors. And so by this time, the congregations in this area were largely Gentile. Uh, there were some Jews, but they were largely, gen largely Gentiles. They were experiencing persecution for their faith, mostly instigated by the Jews. Uh, but then Peter begins and he says, hey, you, you Gentiles here, you're actually part of God's family. Uh, Jews and Gentiles are now together. There's nothing to separate them. Paul makes a big deal about that in things like Galatians and in Romans and, uh, well, most of his epistles, actually. Uh, Peter doesn't go into the great theological depth of it, but he does say, hey, you know, you are, you are children of Abraham. So we have, like, Abraham here, all the Jews who are pilgrims to this world. And then we have, maybe that's Peter, maybe some other Jew. No, this is Peter. So the Jewish fellow, come along, we're family. These are the Roman COVID uh, Gentiles, but they are now belong to the family of Abraham. So even though he's writing mainly to uh, Gentile Christians, Peter, well, because he's a Jew, uses a lot of Judaisms or Jewish expressions. So let's uh, read 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 3 through 9. We'll start with this. Anybody want to? Volunteer? Actually. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is undying, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Through faith, you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Before we get to the next uh, two paragraphs, I obviously highlighted something and put something down there in Hebrew. That's more for my benefit rather than yours to remind me, again, that Peter is very Jewish. Um, I, anybody see Shtisel or anybody ever watch any, like, Orthodox Jewish TV or... Oh, it's one of my favorites. You should, if you have Netflix, really do watch Shtisel. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, my wife and I are, are addicted. What's that? It's a series. It's a series. Stiesel. It's in three seasons now. Oh, that's a, that's a, yeah, like when you show up the whole thing. Yeah. No, that's Fauda. That's, that's different. Oh, that's different. Fauda is, is different. Stiesel is, uh, oh, whatever. But they, it's, it's, a lot of it's in Hebrew. Most of it's in Hebrew. Uh, so with the English subtitles, of course, because it's made for Israelis. Uh, but they begin their prayers by saying, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam which is, blessed be you, O Lord God, King of the ages, or King forever, King of everything. So th there's all these various Jewish prayers, uh, prayers for a thousand different things, and they have this formula that, you know, you can, for this day, you put in this phrase, and if it's for something special, then you put in another phrase, and depending on it's how you want, you can put in another phrase. So they have combinations of prayers that can make, you know, in the millions. Uh, depending on what you feel like, what season it is. But every single one of their prayers begins with this. Blessed are you, Lord Almighty, or Lord God. So Peter, he's so Jewish. Blessed be God the Father. Or blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. So I, just wanted, I wanted to point that, that Judaism out. And you know, he, he begins by you know, praising God and talking about all the wonderful things God has done for us. But we'll get more into detail after we read these next two paragraphs. And, um, excuse me, I have to get a bottle of water. Uh, could somebody just read those two paragraphs out loud? Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> because of you rejoice very much. Wait, because of this you rejoice very much. 
Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various kinds of trials, so that the proven chapter of your life, character of your life, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Next one. Oh, You're on a roll. Okay. Uh, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet by believing in him, you have you are filled with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you. So uh, now that we've read uh, the section, let's move on to questions. So we'll go back to verses 3 through 5, and again, you can just refer to what's on your sheet. Uh, it's all printed out there for you. So, what does it mean for us to bless God? Now, we often think of God blessing us, and certainly God does bless immensely, us immensely. But I've had people ask me, well, why do we say we bless you, O Lord, or bless we the Lord? It's even in our liturgy. Shows respect. It show, certainly shows respect, yes. Um... Those of you who went to first service, you know what blessed means. Uh, Laura, you didn't go to first service, but I'm sure you have a good answer. Uh, my initial thought was the same as Roger's, like hallowing his name, he, that we honor him. But um, wasn't it like kind of a theme in the Old Testament where people would pray to God or... Um, ask him not to do certain things that would disparage his name among the people or to ask him to do certain mm -hmm. things that would bring praise to his name among the other nations. That is true. We want your name to be blessed among the nations. Uh, you can certainly, I mean, this expression has a lot packed into it. But again, those of you who went to first service and actually paid attention, uh, mm -hmm. what does blessed mean? Lisa, happy. happy, without a care, joyful. That's really what blessed means. And, and, the, and, and the, the, the attitudes, blessed are the weak, weak, meek, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. They are happy. They, are, they have an inner joy uh, in their heart. Now, why do we want, why do we say blessed be you? But why do we want God to be happy? And Laura, what you said goes along with that. That's a part of what makes God happy. Why do we want God to be happy? Because we don't want him to be mad. That's one reason. <laughs> Can you think of a more positive way of expressing that? What gives God great joy? Believing in him. Believing in him. Trusting in him. I find it difficult, though, because bless is a noun. I mean, her happy to be happy with yeah. a noun or an adjective, but it's used as a verb. Mm -hmm. So... You're not doing anything with the passive? Well, it's, it's you know, blessed be you. Uh, it, it is a, a verb in the... <coughs> What's that? It's an adjective. It is an adjective when it says blessed, unless you're using it as a perfect passive participle. Right. Um, but so blessed is the noun. But may, may you be blessed, O Lord, is basically what he's saying. Uh, page. Would it be we want you to be happy because we have faith in you? Exactly. We have faith in you uh, because what makes, again, what makes God happy when his people are in harmony with him? And how does that happen? When his name is glorified, when we have faith in him, when we, uh, you know, look to him for salvation instead of damnation. All these things make God happy. So we want God to be blessed. We want God to be in a good mood. We want God to be free from concerns about his people sinning and his people not obeying his word. We want God's name to be proclaimed and glorified throughout the world. So these are all things that we're simply praying for when we say, blessed be God, or may you be blessed, O oh God. Uh, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, you know, the first petition. 
hallowed be thy name. Well, we're not going as fast as that. Uh, what is Peter teaching us about God when he calls God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's kind of a fuzzy question. John? He's going into the Trinity. He is certainly going into the Trinity. Acknowledging that there's two persons, one God still. Yeah, I mean, he does not mention the Holy Spirit, right. per se, but... Uh... God and Father of our Lord. Uh, uh, Laura? I want to say, along with blessed be, it is indicating that God is happy with what Jesus has done. Mm-hmm. So God is definitely, uh, you know, here's my son with whom I am well pleased. That those of us who are familiar with the, the events in Christ's life, that would pop into our minds. Um, although it, it's, it doesn't get into great detail, but you cannot say something like this without a full understanding of, and here's the big theological term, the eternal begetting of Christ from his heavenly father. Again, this is not a... A proof passage for that, but again, you cannot say this, that God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because we know from the rest of the scriptures that Christ is eternal, and so that relationship between God and Father is an eternal, uh, an eternal begetting, an eternal generation of, of Christ from his Heavenly Father. Uh, what is the difference between mercy and and grace. We use them a lot, and you know they're very they're very similar in definition, but there is there is enough of a difference to talk about it here now. Sure. Uh, wouldn't mercy be when you say like have mercy on them? You're asking uh, God to forgive them. Okay. And then the grace is uh, love. You're asking for the love. Okay. Uh, that's true. Uh, grace is, uh, or mercy is like, Lord, have mercy on them. Don't punish them as they deserve. And grace is love. But let's let's expand those a little bit more. Uh, and that's 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 actually true. But I'd like to see what anybody else has to say about that. John, I think you can show mercy to someone because of their circumstance. Yeah. Um, grace is more undeserved. Yeah. So mercy is, is related to pity, you know, in a sense, like, oh, man, you know, this, this guy is really suffering. I'm going to be merciful to him and help him out. Now, certainly God has done that with us. He has been merciful to us. Mercy takes a look at the person's awful situation and reacts in love. So it has something, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bilateral thing. Uh, mercy sees the situation and then reacts to the situation. So something external to the person uh, in, in, uh, incites mercy and compassion in that person's heart. L grace, though, is totally within God. Uh, God uh, just loves, and it's like you know the, the sower sowing his seed wildly. God, God just sends out love, 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 love everywhere. God so loved the world, everything. Uh, certainly, he had mercy on the world, and he loved the world, but he loved the world without even looking at what we've done. We said, grace, uh, grace comes first, and then mercy flows from grace? Yeah, you could say that, uh, you know, because it, if you look at the heart of God, the way the Bible describes God's love, uh, love is the, the pulsing, beating heart of God. God is love. It says in 1 John, and because of his great love for us, God, who is merciful, you know, uh, so yeah, uh, you could say chronologically, or chronologically, God really isn't a, a thing, but you could say uh, logically or thematically that uh, love or grace comes first. So how did God give us a new birth? Peter does not specifically mention it by name, but whenever we hear new birth, we automatically think. Yep. Baptism, as we said. Mm -hmm. Okay, baptism. Uh, definitely, that's how we were born again. 
Uh, we were born naturally from our mothers, but God rebirthed us. Uh, in this verse, hope is a noun, not a verb. And earlier Lisa mentioned the difference between nouns and verbs and how you have to take them into consideration. So what significance does it have for the assurance of our salvation? You know, because it says, uh, you know, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What's the difference between hope as a noun and hope as a verb? I hope that, what would you say? Okay, uh, well, I was going to say hope is something that could happen and that you want to happen, but you don't know it's going to happen. But as a noun, you already know it's going to happen. Yes, exactly. Very, very well stated. As a verb, you hope something was happen. You don't know it's going to happen. You want it to happen. It might happen, might not happen. Uh, but that's when it's a verb uh, in English language. But basically, this is what is hoped for. So it is, it's a, basically a done deal and to a living hope or the, to, uh, w the thing that is uh, expected to come, or the thing that, you know, an expectation. And maybe, again, I always say that hope is a weak word in English. In Greek, it is much stronger. And that Greek meaning of hope is expectation. Like, I expect this to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but I, ex I expect it to happen. So, no, I, oh man, I hope I eat lunch today. Sounds like, no, what, you got no food in your house? You're, you're poor, you can't go to you know, these McDonald's? No, I expect to eat lunch today means that we probably have food in our house. Oh, I know we have food in our house. Uh, but it's more like, this thing is going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. So, if you want to, uh, every time you see the word hope in the scripture, put either expect or expectation. Uh... So, what is a living hope as opposed to a dead hope? Age. It's active. It's still going on. A dead hope would be able to learn. It's like that is like stopped existing. Yeah. Now, Saint Peter does not use the expression "dead hope." It's just uh, I wanted to bring this question up to kind of highlight what is living hope. And you said it very well, and it's active. So um, because I expect something to happen, I am going to react to that. And so that's the same thing with we expect to go to heaven, and therefore we're going to do something. And in this first section, it's how we deal with persecution. So because we expect this uh, hope, because we expect uh, what are we expecting? Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead for the inheritance. So, why is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead so important? I know that's kind of a duh question, but in this context here. Or in any context. Sure. Uh, because he rose from the dead, we will also rise from the dead. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I guess I shouldn't ask you to remember since you couldn't couldn't remember this uh, sermon today that you just heard, uh, I suppose I can't ask you to remember the opening line of my sermon last Sunday for the Easter. You remember it? If only for. Uh, yeah. I have all signed your second. Who are you again? Um, if I only for even, this. I don't even remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the last Yeah, but I repeated it like 17 times. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, uh, we are to be pitied more than all men. And that's kind of what Peter's talking about. Look, if you are suffering persecution and Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, you're idiots. Stop suffering persecution. You know, deny Christ because this is the whole thing. You rise from the grave, you rise out of this sinful world and are brought to eternal life in heaven where there's no persecution, no trouble, no, no, uh, no heartache, nothing bad. So if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you know, everything's, everything about Christianity is useless. 
a Christ rising from the dead is truly the foundation. It's what it's all about. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. Or I remember that book that we read, um, uh, Searching for Allah, Finding Jesus, written by a, a Muslim convert. And one of the key things I remember, he had Christian friends, and they were basically, he was a Muslim apologist, and his friends were Christian apologists, so they had these these great arguments and these great debates about, you know, Islam versus Christianity. And so finally, they convinced, uh, I forget his name, remember his name? Mahmoud, we'll call him. Uh, whatever. Ismail, I don't know, whatever. So, so finally, the, the Muslim guy says, okay, you have given me sufficient arguments to grant to you the fact that, okay, Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, but what else do you have? And the, and the Christian apology says, what else do you need? <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. It's like, you know, the Christianity is true. What else do you need? Um, so I found that very, it stuck with me. So what is an inheritance? Don't think too hard. Just that. Something that you get after someone dies. Yeah. Something after you get when, some, when someone dies. When you are in their will. I'm uh, spending mine. Yeah. No, you're not spending yours. You're spending Jeff's and Tim's. Tim's, they're not. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, I read a, in an article, a financial article, uh, the other day. Uh, you should plan your finances in your life so that the last check that you write bounces. <laughs> in other words, you know, you should, you, should, you should write your money down to zero uh, when you die. <laughs> so. Keep on going. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> Don't forget the church. Um, that's the last That's the one that's going to bounce. That's the one that's going to bounce. I said, Don't forget the church. They said, That's the one that's going to bounce. One million dollars. <laughs> I'm glad somebody else was on my side thinking that, Roger. <laughs> but actually, in, again, in the Greek, the word inheritance. Um, doesn't necessarily depend on somebody dying. It means to gain possession of something. That something that wasn't yours has now become yours. Now certainly, that's what happens in an inheritance. Your, your, you know, your parents, it's usually parents to children, your parents, you know, great fortune gets passed on to you. That's, and then you gain possession of what they had. So what is our inheritance? What do we gain possession of? because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Heaven, eternal life in heaven. Uh, salvation, forgiveness of sins. What three ways does Peter describe our inheritance? It is? Undying. Undying. Undefiled. Undefiled and? Unfading. Excuse me, unfading. So compared with earthly inheritances, or compared with things that you get possession of, your earthly inheritance can be spent by, you know, a, a careless father. Um, your earthly inheritance can be defiled. Uh, you know, th something you gain possession of can be defiled. It, it can be, it can rot. It can spoil. It can uh, you know, lose value. Let's say that you, you know, you. Uh, you give your children all sorts of, uh, you, you think Bitcoin's the greatest thing, so you buy like all your money in Bitcoin, and then well, people realize that Bitcoin is just a, a farce and it goes down to like $2 a share instead of $16,000. So yeah, that, that, would, that would kind of uh, defile the, or it would unfade, it would fade the value. So I, I think you get the point, that with human inheritances, you can misspend it, you can lose it, it, it's not reliable. Heaven's check doesn't bounce. Heaven's check doesn't bounce. Very good. Huh. Because Jesus Christ never dies. That's why. So, uh, how can we be sure that we will get our inheritance? Okay, Christ is, did you say Christ has promised, promised it? And that's certainly one way. Look at the text, though. Right after he says it's undefiled, undying, unfading, he says, 
What? Kept in heaven for you. Kept in heaven for you. It's like your, uh, you know, your, 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 your parents have all these gold bars and they're locked in a safety deposit bank in, in, the, in a safety deposit box in the most secure bank in America. You know, that's, it's kept for you. It's, it's, it's guarded. And that's actually the word uh, kept is actually a word from the military uh, in, in the Greek. It's uh, basically you've got, you know, the guards in front of this treasure and they're not going to let anybody take it. Of course, God is a lot stronger than any Greek guard or Roman guard. So if God is keeping it, you know, guarding it in heaven for you, it's going to stay there. You're not, you're not going to lose it. And then it says in verse, it goes on to say in verse 5, through faith you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed, to be revealed at the end time. Does faith actually protect us? Yes. How? I mean, you can answer it yes, you can answer it no. Um, the, how do you, how, what is the reason for saying yes? Faith? It's something Jesus has given us with his power, so it's part of like, Jesus' power in us. Okay. So that way it protects us. Okay, so it, it uh, Krista? So I mean, say the Holy Spirit works through faith, so through the Holy Spirit working through faith, it protects So you both, uh, you both mentioned uh, members of the Trinity, uh, Jesus and the, Holy, and the Holy Spirit. So, and that's pretty much the answer why we can say, yes, faith does protect us, because it brings us into, it puts us in Christ. Faith puts us in Christ. But how could you also say that faith, you can't, you can't say it, or it doesn't protect us. And it doesn't? Yeah. You can, you can answer, like I said, you can answer yes or no, depending on how you're viewing it. If you didn't have God's power. God's power protects us. Yes, God's power. But faith by itself is not the protector. God is a protector. So what does faith do, though? John? Makes you believe that God's the protector. You can't use believe in a defense in a in a, in a definition because uh, believe in faith. Faith is, is given to us. Yes, faith is given to us, but how can you say that faith really isn't what protects us? Or oh, isn't what protects us. Yeah, uh, yeah. So making the uh, opposite argument. What did you yeah. say? I was thinking about the seal that we have, but he's saying how it doesn't protect. Us. Okay, let's let's picture our salvation, and you know, being Christians, being in you know, a mighty fortress is our God. So, the fortress is what protects you. Can you figure out what faith is in this analogy? John. The door into the castle or into the, the... Yeah, the way into the castle. That's faith. So you could say that, yes, faith protects me because it puts me inside the castle. But what's really protecting me is the castle. So... The fortress. The fortress. The mighty fortress is our God. Faith is simply the <laughs> instrument the Holy Spirit uses to get us from outside the fortress of God and put us inside. So it is a means, but it is not the actual thing that protects us. But because the Holy Spirit works faith, because God is in control of faith, we can say that faith does save us and faith does protect us. But I back off of that because sometimes we, when we say, oh, my faith will protect me. Sometimes we get some wrong ideas about that, that my, uh, my faith is so strong I am protected, and we start to reflect on ourselves rather than on God. And we start to think it's my faith, or because I believe so strongly this has to happen. Uh, no, uh, it's because God has used faith to put you in Christ. Krista? Wouldn't you say both, though? Because you can't be protected if you're not inside the castle. So right. you have to be both. Yes. That's why I said you can answer yes and no. And is another word for both. <laughs> so, yes. But very good observance. Thank you for thank you for um, picking up on what I was laying down. Uh, 
<laughs> Why is our salvation not yet revealed? Don't think too hard. We didn't die yet. Yeah, you're, you're still here. Think to yourself. Yeah, I'm here. I'm not in heaven. So it's not yet revealed. Uh, judgment day hasn't come. Okay, I answered my next question. Uh, when will be revealed? Judgment day. Uh, how are these verses a great comfort for persecuted Christians? Focus off of current, uh, maybe bodily or emotional distress, and focuses it on the sure hope we have of all of that going away at some point in time, and there's a reward for our faith versus what we would see on earth as a punishment. Yeah. So, yeah, just to uh, rephrase you, because I don't know how well the camera picks up your voice, but I know it picks up my voice very well. Um, yeah, uh, this, the, the, the suffering you're enduring for the sake of Christ here on this earth is not a punishment, and it's not going to last forever. There is something uh, that is guaranteed for you up in heaven, and no matter what happens, what you lose here in this life, uh, you have a better eternal life waiting for you that will more than compensate for any troubles you experience here on this earth. I don't know if that's an exact paraphrase of what you said, but... Question? I'm just giving you a thumbs up. Oh, okay. Well, we'll move on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I won't have somebody else... I won't have it read out loud again. Just quickly scan through these verses, 6 and 7. And you know, if you just look back at verses 3 to 5, there's no mention of persecution in verse 3 to 5. It's just all this is what God has done for you. It's a done deal. Yay. Now he begins to talk about persecution a little bit. So before Peter talks about persecution, he first proclaims God's assurance of their salvation. Why is that a good way to start a letter to persecuted Christians? John? It's like Laura was saying, it takes them their mind off of their present suffering and look forward to the end goal and end game. Yeah. Yeah, no matter how bad it gets, we know how it's going to end. So that's, that's a, because I've told you the ending already. I'm, I'm, spoiler alert, you're going to heaven. <laughs> Peter will explain why Christians will rejoice greatly in suffering, but at first glance, doesn't this seem extremely odd? He says, in this you greatly rejoice, when I that's James. Oh no, because of this, you rejoice very much even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various kinds of trials. Now, I, I know I already said that, yes, everything's done, you, because that's why you rejoice, but rejoice in sufferings? Wouldn't you expect rather put up with, tolerate, you know, tough it out? I think that's what our normal human expectation would be, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, at the end, you know, it's going to be okay at the end. You know, quit your whining, quit your complaining. No. He says, you greatly rejoice. That's, that's, that does seem odd, doesn't it? Or maybe I should ask, I, why does it seem odd? I thought that because of this, you rejoice very much was referring to the salvation and all that. Yes. It, but, but, but again, what's his... Yes, you, you rejoice greatly because you know heaven is yours. Even though you've had to suffer here. Right. And my point is, that's how, how do you, when you get persecuted, when, when, when people make fun of you for your faith, do you rejoice? Not really. Not really. Our natural tendency is to feel sorry for ourselves or get upset. 
Our natural reaction is a lot of negative emotions. But Peter says here, uh, and even though you know you're going to heaven, still our natural reaction is, I'll be honest with you, it's not rejoicing for me. I don't go home and say, yay, somebody chewed me out for being a Christian. Somebody called me an idiot for believing in Jesus. But Peter says, yeah, you can actually rejoice when you are suffering. But again, well, you know, he gave us the first reason, because you're going to go to heaven. But then I, I, get, I mentioned that our natural reaction, if we were writing this, we would say, so okay, you know, tough it out, tough it out. You know, you know how it's going to end, you know, quit your whining, quit your complaining. Uh, are you going to say something, Kate? I was going to say the reason he might say that is because it means we're displaying our cake and people see it and decide to pay comments for it. Yeah, and eventually he's going to say that. So, so I mean, good. I mean, you're, you're picking up what Peter's laying down, so. Uh, what is a trial? And again, the Greek is there for my benefit, not so much for yours. What is a trial? When we hear the word trial. Think of uh, innocent and guilt. Okay. For somebody who okay. trial. There, there's a big trial going on in our country right now. Yes, there is. What's, it, what's the purpose of that trial? That you said? Innocent or guilt. To determine innocence or guilt. How does a trial proceed? What, what happens in a trial? Facts are presented. Facts are presented. Witnesses. Witnesses. Arguments are made. Arguments are made. And all for the sake of? Sure. Discovering Justice. The truth. Justice. You know, discovering the truth about what really happened. So, um, how can we say that, you know, you're going through trials? What is the truth that we want to come up with finally? when God allows you to suffer for your faith. Laura? He says we're going to go through the fire to, so the trial is the fire to prove ourselves pure or to get rid of the impurities. Mm -hmm which I guess makes our faith stronger, more resilient, or able to encourage others through their trials. I'd also say more pure, and we know that because of the upcoming illustration about gold being refined by fire, being tested by fire. Right. Why do you do that? Why do you melt down gold? So you can take the impurities out. And so a pure uh, faith that is more pure again, focuses more on the, the spiritual, focuses more on the forgiveness of sins, focuses more on Christ in us and for us, rather than all the outward circumstances, whether you're rich or poor, uh, you know, whether you're persecuted or saved. Uh, that's why God wants to purify your faith with trials. Uh, would it be appropriate to translate this word test or temptation? Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, and even temptation, because a temptation is a trial. It is, it is something that you're being put through in order to determine the quality of your faith. It is a test. As a matter of fact, uh, this word, uh, uh, parasmus, is, uh, you know, um, and lead us not into temptation. It's the same word. <coughs> so, uh, but again, uh, I love... Uh, it's not pyrasis, it's pyrasmus. And if you ever remember the sma or sma ending, you remember what I, what I always point that out in Greek? It's something that has happened. So St. Paul is saying these are things that are events, that they're, they're, they're punctiliar. They're not a process. You, you won't have to deal with this all the time. It'll come, you know, sometimes... 15 temptations or tests or trials will come to you in one day. Maybe next day it's only two. Uh, so that's, that's kind of baked into the Greek word, or the formal word. How can Peter say that the trials are for a little time? Were you a question? Or? No. 
Um, because, well, eternally we'll be in heaven and earth is just for a little time. So, yeah. in comparison of what the experience we're going to have in heaven, which is going to be for Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're comparing earthly life to eternity, and earthly life uh, is, a, is a blip compared to eternity. However, at the time, it doesn't feel so good. Uh, this is only going to hurt for a while. What would make trials necessary? Okay, so it's necessary for the benefit of our faith, Lisa. Mm -hmm. It can definitely strengthen our faith. Yeah, so uh, we all need to have faith strengthened, and so <clears throat> trials are one way that God uses to do that. Why do trials grieve us? This that don't think too hard. Krista? They're painful. They're painful. No discipline is pleasant at the time, but painful, it says in Hebrews 12. But what is the benefit of trials? Again, hopefully get to the truth. To the truth that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ. Or, <coughs> is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Uh, Lisa mentioned uh, the hymn we sang today. Uh, this is a great hymn written by Paul Gerhardt. Basically, anything Paul Gerhardt writes is gold. Uh, why should cross and trial grieve me? Christ is near with his tear. Never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the heaven that God's son for me won when his life was given? When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. God, my loving Savior, sees them. He who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God gives me days of gladness, and I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. God is good. His love attends me. Day by day, come what may, guides me and defends me. Since I know God never fails me, in his voice I'll rejoice. When grim death assails me, trusting in my Savior's merit, safe at last, troubles past, I shall have an inherit. So I think this is really a nice commentary on this what we've been talking about in First Peter. So. Is that going to be in the new heaven? Yes, I'm sure it will be. Old rugged cross is No, it's not, sorry. <laughs> Lisa. I think it's... You know, we're not... I don't know that... We were mean that God made us to have all these feelings. So it's like yes. a mind over matter thing. Because you are going to feel sad. You can't escape that. Can't escape what? Feeling upset or yes. feeling... I mean, you can't get to... I mean, Jesus felt that way. Yes. And so, I mean, for us to, to pretend that we're just supposed to go, oh, well, and, and everything that we have is just to make no big deal. I mean, that's not real people. No, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to refer to the Psalms. There is a lot of complaining and moaning and whining in the Psalms. But... The Psalms, they complain, you know, David, or the Psalmist complains, he says, this is awful, Lord. Oh, but wait, I trust in you. I can rejoice. I mean, that's a very broad summary of many of the Psalms, but that's, I believe, what Peter is saying here, too. Okay, yes, you're going to rejoice in this. You know heaven's yours. Be happy. Yay. That'll give you joy even when you have troubles. But, oh, yeah, troubles will grieve you. But only for a little while. <clears throat> So there, there is that, the, the both and is, is there. I agree, I agree. Modern American Christians have not experienced any level of harsh trials, especially compared to the recipients of Peter's letter, or even that of Christians from other times and places. H? I would say it depends on who you're talking about. It's very situational. Because some Christians have been bullied, ostracized from their peers, and excluded and made to feel very alone and that sort of thing. But um, some people, like I grew up going to Christian schools, so everyone was Christian. It's fairly normal for me. So I have not experienced any of that sort of um, 
persecution in that setting, but like going to work, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So it's very situational. Some have, some haven't. But I would say at each point in life, it's different. Ashley. I'm going to go ahead and say agree. I can't hear you, sorry. Agree. Agree. And I'm, I'm going to show you why it is a strong, strong agree. First of all, with an article from the Babylon Bee. Unsatisfied persecuted, persecuted church member to try out other church just across minefield, somewhere in Iraq, stating that he just doesn't feel like he's being fed by the persecuted underground church he's been attending for the past three years. Local man Salim Haddad reported Wednesday that he's planning on trying out a competing church just 30 miles across a deadly patch of open desert that is covered with live explosives. Pastor Malik is a great guy and everything, but I don't know, the youth program is just okay and the refreshments are lacking. And Pastor's a pretty good teacher, but he just doesn't make the living word of God really come alive, you know. Uh, Haddad re told reporters through an encoded message for fear of giving away the location of the church, which could result in the further persecution or martyrdom of his brothers and sisters in Christ. I heard about another Christian church about eight hours away from here by foot on the other side of the passage of certain death, he added. I think the family and I are going to check it out. Haddad described his family's wish list for a church as including topical, relevant preaching, contemporary music, feeling like they can all really get connected, and a casual laid-back atmosphere that's warm and inviting, despite having to sneak into the building at night for fear of capture and slaughter by Muslim authorities. We love Pastor Malik, and we wish him all the best, but I feel like it's God's will for us to go to church, shop, to go to church shopping, Haddad said, as he and his family began preparations for their dangerous journey across the mind-laden desert. We really hope this new church has the vibe we're looking for. Okay, Babylon B is great. Uh, satire can teach uh, things, but why did I put this article after that disagree question? Paige, you talked about ostracized and being bullied. It's not as bad as being killed. <laughs> it's not as bad as this. <laughs> and even though this is satire, this is, this is true. Iraqi Christians, they are persecuted. Malaysian Christians, Indonesian Christians, um, other Christians today. Uh, but let's go back in history. Uh, Saint Eulalia, you've probably never heard of her. She's a uh, uh, co-patron saint of Barcelona. Uh, so she's uh, refused to give up her faith and she was crucified. Uh, but they, they've been modest with this. She was crucified naked. So, and then she died. Uh, but she refused to give up her faith in Christ, so that's one of the reasons why she is a patron saint of Barcelona. That's more than just being bullied and ostracized and called names. Uh, next picture. Uh, 1415, Council of Constance. The guy in the middle there being burned at the stake is Jan Hus, uh, the guy who uh, was the like a pre pre predecessor of Luther. You know, taught that the church is the assembly of saints. Uh, you know, said the Pope doesn't have all this power, taught the true body and blood of Christ in the, in the sacrament. Uh, here we have the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre, which took place in 1572 in France. Uh, you know what a Huguenot is? The Huguenots were the, 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 the uh, reformed, mostly the Calvinists in France. Um, and it was like 10% of the population at the time. But... The Catholic Church in the Counter-Reformation said, uh, we don't want these Huguenots, so they, um, there was this big wedding, and uh, a lot of, of, of the uh, Protestant king marrying, Protestant prince marrying a, ca a Catholic French princess. But because the, uh, the Protestants wanted to show their influence, they all showed up, and it was a trap. And uh, they ended up killing all these, the, the, the Roman Catholics ended up killing all these Protestants. I'll skip the description. And uh, here, uh, this is last month, I think. Uh, mourners attend a mass funeral Sunday in Zabamari, Nigeria, for 43 farm workers whose, threats, whose throats were slit the day before, authorities said by Boko Haram fighters in rice fields. If you watch the news, uh, this doesn't get reported in the news, uh, how Christians are being slaughtered every day. Churches are being bombed on Sunday. I forget where it was. India, somewhere. Churches are being bombed. So, 
we do have it easy compared to Christians in the rest of history and the rest of the world. Uh, Paul Gerhardt, I, we looked at his hymn earlier. He, he, was, he lived during the Thirty Years' War. And that was basically, I mean, they talk about it as being the religious wars, and then it became a war for uh, political control between the Habsburgs and the French. Uh, but the real victims were the, the German Lutherans, uh, because, the, the, you know, Spain sent in its troops, and, you know, if you were, if you were a Lutheran pastor and they caught you, you're dead. Uh, so... There was lots of persecution. Germany's population uh, went down by about like 25% during the Thirty Years' War. And most of those people were, were Lutherans. So, all right, woo, let's talk about something more fun. Uh, again, uh, read through it on your own. So what Bible story does verse 8 remind you of? People who went to first service? Doubting Thomas. Yes, Doubting Thomas. You're not, but, you know, Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's Peter's kind of paraphrasing that. How can we love Jesus also even though we have not seen him? Again, don't think too hard. Have we have faith. And by faith, we see Jesus, and we love him, and we know what he's done for us. And why is the joy of believing in Jesus inexpressible? Krista? Because it's beyond the love that we can show towards others. Because God's love is greater than any. Yeah, two words you used, I think, are really the key. Beyond and greater. Um, again, if you went to first service and you paid attention to the sermon, I use the word supernatural a lot. Above nature. It is something that doesn't fit our normal experience. So, the joy that we have looking forward to eternal life is not something that can be adequately expressed in this world because there isn't enough sinlessness in this world to let it all loose, let it all hang out. Uh, and that, that's something that's, I think, pretty important for us uh, conservative Lutherans to, uh, to take note to, that, that we are, I, I think we're very good at, you know, staying within the bounds of expressing our joy. You know, we, don't, we don't want to go too far and show how happy we are that Jesus saves us. I'm not saying we should have whooping it up and, you know, parties during church. But uh, we still have that balance of reverence and respect in our worship. But yet, you know, uh, I'll confess that expressing my joy in the salvation that Christ has won for me is, doesn't come naturally. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I wish I had more of. And you get more of that by getting closer to Christ by studying his word, by repenting, confessing, staying within Christian fellowship and all that. Uh, why is the present tense in verse 9 so comforting? Because you are receiving, not will receive, but you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. John? Um, because our faith is secure and it's not dependent on us. We're just receiving yeah, you are receiving. Uh, it's, it's not, again, it's not something indefinite. It is something that is happening right now. You have eternal life right now. You will live forever. Yeah, you're going to die. Your body's going to die. But it will be raised again, and you will live forever. And so you have eternal life right now. You have heaven right now. It is your possession. Uh, but you don't get to spend it right now. It's, again, kind of like going back to an inheritance. You know, uh... Our daughters are past the age now, so if Lisa and I die in a terrible car wreck or something like that, uh, you know, our, our daughters get to share our, our, our vast wealth. Um, and uh, what, what was I going to say? Uh, but when they were younger, our will was set up that had we died, 
they wouldn't get this if they were like 14, they wouldn't get to spend all the money from the insurance policies. It was going to be distributed in third set. I think it was 18, 23, and 30 or something like that. So something like that. Uh, so that's kind of our inheritance. It, it, that money would be theirs, but they wouldn't get to spend it until a certain time. Heaven is ours. It's already given to us. We've already inherited heaven, but we don't get to enjoy it until a certain time. So we're in that growing up phase of our salvation. Laura? Um, for me, maybe extrapolating a little bit more than is there, <laughs> um, it just makes me feel like God is with me through my trials. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the only word I don't like in that sentence was feel. It makes me feel you know, God is with you, whether you feel it or not. Right, I'm just saying um, that particular, the yeah. use of the present tense, yeah. I guess, helps me know or makes me feel, I don't know. I'm sorry, I pick on the word feel way too much. And I, <laughs> I jumped all over you, on the, I, I apologize. Only human, right? <laughs> You're only human, I'm sorry. But I, I hope you realize why I jumped on that so quickly, because, yeah. again, when we use the word sure. feel, I feel, yeah. there's this level of subjectivity, and whenever you have level of human subjectivity in it, there's also doubt. But because God proclaims to me that no matter what I am, where I am, I am still a recipient of eternal life. So, mm -hmm. Sorry for being such no, a I get <laughs> theology Nazi. Is that even possible? That's a kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Last question, and it shouldn't be too difficult. Peter directed the attention of persecuted Christians the joys and glories of heaven. Why do we also need that to happen to us, even though we are not suffering such extreme outward persecution? <laughs> Laura is skeptical because I pick on her answers. <laughs> she is a brave person. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, and I don't want to attack your... Um the points you're putting forward either so you know that's not what's happening here but I guess um, or what I have to say about that is we're, we are not called to suffer other people's persecution and I'm not I'm not trying to be heartless about the persecution that other people suffer mm -hmm. as opposed to what I suffer as much as I dare say they could not um, they could not want my persecution in place of theirs. It's got where God has placed us. Mm -hmm. And so our faith is suffering a certain trial, and that is where God has called us to prove us. To. I mean, that's very well said. That you cannot, you know, some person's pain is not your pain, and your pain is not their pain. I mean, that's true spiritually speaking, that's true psychologically speaking. But I wanted to get to this, the out, extreme outward persecution. The, um, the difference between outward and inner. Because who is the great persecutor? Satan. Satan. And even though outwardly your life may be easy, Satan knows how to attack you and persecute you exactly. with spiritual turmoil. Mm -hmm. uh, John, is that what you're going to say? Or? Uh, I just had an analogy that in my personal life that for months I've been dreading this home improvement project that I'm currently working on. Yeah. And just the other night I just started on it and realized it's not nearly as bad as I thought, but in my head it was this awful thing that was going to just be a nightmare. Right? And so, dealing with things in your head are oftentimes worse than the reality. Yes. Right? You can make things much, much worse in your mind than what the, the reality actually is. Yes. Well, that comes in so many ways, but uh, yeah, I, I understand, I think I understand what you're trying to say, that uh, the inner struggles are sometimes far worse than the outer struggles. Right. And again, I, I, who's the great persecutor? It's Satan. 